This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. Hey, this is Brian Peña. I always join the Vito Vodcast, the best vodcast in the United States. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the latest, the freshest edition of Tiger's Talk with Chirko and Company. I am your host, Vito Geronimo Chirko, alongside my usual psychic and broadcast partner and fun. That is it out from Doc and Jack. John Charles Macaroon. John, how are you doing? Definitely excited to record this podcast. I want to thank the great sponsors of this podcast, the Detroit Sports Commission and the Legacy Football Organization, for allowing us to put on this great broadcast. Oh, man, Vito, lots to get to in the world of baseball. I missed you, man. What's been going on? It's been a little bit. Uh, we've been doing it every uh, other week right now, Tigers Talk Recordings. And with that being said, you know, there are spring training news and notes to get to. And I don't know how many people are truly interested in hearing everything about the Tigers right now. But you have stuff that happened in yesterday's game where Miguel Cabrera really stood out by having this hidden ball trick. It got a guy out at first base. I don't know if you saw that, but it kind of went viral and whatnot. I retweeted it on Twitter. Sports Center even covered it and showed the highlight of him getting a runner out at first base by using that hidden ball trick. So the runner at first base, I don't know who it was, from the Minnesota Twins, did not realize that Cabrera still had the ball and didn't throw it back to the pitcher and got out the guy there through doing that, which was pretty cool to see from Miguel Cabrera. Manager Ron Gardenhire came out and said, look, if Miguel Cabrera, we got to find any avenue to keep this man healthy because he will hit. And early on, Miguel Cabrera said in his first couple at-bats that he felt a little bit awkward in that, you know, last year he had that bicep injury and it cost him the majority of his season. And coming back, he said it was a little bit awkward, a little bit weird, but he's now finding his rhythm, getting back in the mix. And yeah, that was a, (laughs) when I saw that come across the wire, I thought that was funny. The uh, good old hidden ball trick. But in spring training so far, it seems like with the Tigers, um, there are concerns regarding some of the pitchers and there are some concerns regarding velocity, I think is the word of the week in that. Um, people are noticing that the velocity of Michael Fulmer in his last appearance and the velocity of Daniel Norris have not been in the mid-90s like we're all accustomed to. So are you concerned at all? Or like I saw from some of the beat writers, they said, look, in terms of Michael Fulmer, he's rehabbing an injury and he's coming back and they're working on, in terms of his mechanics, getting things back in order. Because when he first started spring training, they admitted that everything was out of whack with Michael Fulmer and the pitching coach, I believe Rick Anderson came out and said, look, we got to repair that motion. We got to make sure that, you know, in terms of his arm slot, in terms of his leg kick, we get it back in, in sync. And so that's really important. And so he wasn't trying to really ramp up the velocity according to what Michael Fulmer said, because people were asking him, they were like, whoa, 91, 92 or so was what I believe he topped out at. And he comes out and people are like, look, uh, what's going on with you? Are you okay? He's getting asked questions from the media. And he comes out and says, look, I think I pitched pretty good. If I pitch to contact and I get guys out, what is it that you want? Do you want me just to blow guys away and give up a couple home runs? Or do you want me to actually get guys out and throw 95 miles an hour? What is it that you actually want? So I understand where he's coming from. And I think the message that they're trying to to send and spin is, look, Michael Fulmer probably can ramp it up. The one that's concerning is Daniel Norris in that he's obviously trying to work on upping the miles per hour. He's working with Jordan Zimmerman, Rick Anderson, to try and get it back because it was quite alarming. He struggled quite a bit, and some of the other pitchers as well, uh, most notably Matt Moore, has really struggled in the games that I've watched. So for the pitchers so far in spring training, the talking point is, where the hell's the velocity, Vito? Well, Fulmer now, three right meniscus surgeries. So after all those surgeries, his velocity has dipped significantly. It is, you know, averaging 88 to 92 miles per hour on the radar gun. And talent evaluators are saying, too, after his most recent outing, Doc, that he's not looking right out there on the mound. He's not looking like the Michael Fulmer of old. But you got to remember this, too, Doc. In 2018, Fulmer wasn't that efficient. 
He was not the Michael Fulmer of 2016 when he won the American League Rookie of the Year Award or the Michael Fulmer in 2017 when he was an All-Star. So when people thought after 2017, too, he's going to take the next step and become a legitimate ace that could maybe even be a dark horse candidate to win the American League Cy Young Award. Well, that hasn't developed out of Michael Fulmer uh, as of late, and specifically when you look back at his 2018 campaign. When you look back at 2018, for Michael Fulmer. It was a season marred by the injury bug getting the best of him, him not looking the sharpest, him getting rocked at times, and not looking like an ace caliber right-handed arm that could lead and be the leader of the Tigers rotation. So Fulmer now, you have to have your doubts and worries about him going into the 2019 regular season that he's not going to be the same Michael Fulmer, the effective Michael Fulmer once again from 2016 and 2017, his first two years in the big leagues. I never like getting tweets from uh, our supporters at Detroit Podcast that say this, darn it, we should have gotten rid of Michael Fulmer when we had the chance. And I got a handful of those tweets, and I'm like, oh, my goodness. You know, in terms of Michael Fulmer, I do think, though, that in spring training, there are times when, you know, you're trying to work on pitches, you're trying to work on mechanics, and the results don't necessarily mean a whole heck of a lot. And sometimes us geek nicks and nerds and stat people. Well, you being the nerd, maybe not the stat guy per se or the analytical guy, but still you're a nerd. Anyways. Yeah, and and so we sometimes overplay and overreact to what we're seeing in that. um, I recall hearing on the radio uh, during one of the spring training games that, you know, a certain pitcher was just specifically working on throwing a changeup. You know, trying to get it over the plate, trying to, you know, really consistently throw it over the plate. And sometimes in spring training, you just go there with a specific mindset, a specific goal of just like, hey, I'm going to throw this change up. I'm going to throw this curveball and whatever happens, happens in, in, in an effort to try and uh, really work on goals and improve your, your pitches. So I'm not as worried about Michael Fulmer. I'm really concerned about Daniel Norris. I just think that in terms of consistency, he's got the stuff. And year in, year out for the last couple of seasons, what are we talking about? His mindset, his attitude. Can he consistently go out there every fifth day and handle his business? And for me, it just kind of reeks of a guy that probably might be better suited in the bullpen. Just one or two innings, boom, when you need that momentum, you need a guy coming in right away, full speed ahead, try to get those six outs. Uh, I don't see him as a long reliever. I see him as a guy, maybe sixth, seventh, eighth inning guy. Boom, when you need quick outs. And I don't see him in a position where... I don't see flexibility. You know what I mean? I don't see a guy that if the runners are on second and third, one out, that I'm super confident if you bring him on, he's going to strike two people out. You bring him in when there's no runners on base. So in situations where it's not high leverage, meaning in situations where the game's not on the line, which isn't good to say about this guy who's still young, very young, in the prime of his career, supposedly. And now he's dealt with the injury bug himself and a dip in velocity. But the thing going for him is that he's a lefty. He can be a lefty specialist out of the pen. So hopefully, at least in the future, if he's going to be a bullpen arm, that he can be a high leverage lefty specialist kind of arm. So a guy that goes in there, it could be the sixth inning as early as that, in the seventh as well, in the eighth inning as well, but is used in those high leverage situations to get out left-handed batters. But how long does he get? I mean, seriously... It seems like he's a candidate, if he doesn't get off to a good start, to be maybe waived or be sent Not to the Not waived, but sent to the bullpen. I think he could be in mm. the bullpen. Now, the thing is, I don't think the Tigers really envisioned him having a long-term future in the bullpen or being a guy they wanted to rely upon in the bullpen moving forward into the long term. They wanted to see him really grow into a nice, at least, a third arm in the rotation, a guy that can be an effective number three starter. And he hasn't become that, he hasn't been that, and shown those qualities, Doc, at least as of late. And that's really scary when you look at this guy. He's already dealt with the injury bug once again, and he's still, what, uh, 26 years young, I like to say, in the prime of his career, supposedly. And there's already tons of red flags regarding his health moving forward and whether or not he can sustain enough success as a starting arm. So let me put it to you this way, Vito. 50% will Daniel Norris finish the season with the Tigers this year? I say yes because, you know what, he's not going to have any other suitors out there. Now, I mean, if you're saying will he end up in the minors at some point this season, well, I think the percent chance of that, as you see the uh, continued struggles of Daniel Norris out there in spring camp, you can say over 50% the chances of him ending up in AAA Toledo at some point in the 2019 season. And that's not good in itself. But him moving on to another team or being dealt uh, to another team or being cut, I don't see that happening because he's still so darn young. And remember, he was one of the prized trade chips in that trade with the Blue Jays, in which the Jays landed David Price from the Tigers. Norris was involved in that deal, and Norris was one of the centerpieces of that deal. However, Matthew Boyd has become the most effective starting arm 
of that return that the Tigers did receive for David Price. So remember that, that they have Matthew Boyd, and he's the guy that's more movable that I could see being moved by the July 31 non-waiver trade deadline. What about Michael Fulmer? Do you see him ramping it up, having a good season up or down so far? Uh, How important is it for him, especially to rebound after last season? Because now the question marks are coming in because this was a guy that many people pegged to say, you know what? you might be able to flip him, and they didn't take advantage of it. Are you concerned at all, or are you like, you know what, I kind of got a feeling that this guy's a bulldog. Eventually speaking, he's going to figure it out, because you're the one that said it last year on many of these podcasts that you can find on our archive via the YouTube page that you said, look, sometimes, uh, because I was high on him, I was like, oh, this is the next guy, this is the next bulldog, and you were like, hold on, year two and three, sometimes there's an adjustment, and the hitters across Major League Baseball, they might have figured him out, and he started to sprinkle in some uh, not-so-good numbers, Towards the end of last year, obviously, injuries affected his season. But how do you think he'll rebound? Do you see Michael Fulmer maybe reclaiming that number one spot, being that bulldog, and trying to really be a leader on this team because they need him? Well, John, you said it best. And year number two and year number three, you see these guys often or at least have the chance of getting into struggles, of not being the same effective arm that they were in their rookie campaign. As for Michael Fulmer, that was a Rookie of the Year campaign once again for himself in the American League. So it was going to be hard for him to uh, take huge strides into the second season, but he did. Became an all-star arm. So he got better in the second year. In the third year, he took the downturn. The thing is now in his fourth season in the bigs, will we realize, Doc, as Tigers fans and pundits alike, that opposing bats have figured him out? have figured out what Fulmer brings to the table. And now because maybe there has been uh, this sustained dip in velocity for Michael Fulmer, that batters will fully realize what they have going up against when it comes to going up against Michael Fulmer. And, And maybe they start really launching big hits off of him, tons of hits off of him. So you don't want to see that happen. But I fear, and I think you have to fear the worst case scenario, even with the young arm and Michael Fulmer that had all of this upside at one point in, when I say at one point before last season started. Man, Vito, you're not bringing the positivity like I thought you would. No, it's hard to be positive when in his third year after two good years in the majors and now a dip in velocity in spring camp early in spring and the season hasn't, regular season hasn't started yet. But still, I mean, to start off, I think in 2019, Fulmer looking strong. I don't know if you're going to see that out of Fulmer right away this season. And, and that's a, a scary thing to consider, once again, as Tigers fans, that you might not see the sharp effect of Michael Fulmer uh, for at least a couple of months to start off the 2019 campaign, Doc. Now, real interesting story. You messaged me, and you said, hey, there's this great reporter that's been out there, has been covering the Tigers in spring training, has been putting out great content via his platform. Who's the guest this week? I'm really fascinated by the story because it's somebody that is not letting any disadvantages really uh, preclude him from doing the work that he wants to do. A real interesting story, one that I'm looking forward to. Dave Stevens from the Disability Channel, Born Without Legs, will be joining us in just a couple of minutes here on this week's episode of Tigers Talk. And Doc, as you know, one of our fine sponsors at the DSP Network is the Detroit Sports Commission, which since 2001 has been bringing tons and hundreds and hundreds of marquee events to our very region. That is the Metro Detroit area, and these events range from from amateur to national to international sporting events that are top-notch events and the best of the best, truly. And these events are put on by the fine staff at the DSC, led by Detroit Sports Commission Director Chris Smith, PR master and extraordinaire Marty Dobek, and others that have made the Detroit Sports Commission a terrific, terrific organization. And to find out more about all of the events that Detroit Sports Commission is bringing to our very region, that is once again the Metro Detroit area, please follow the DSC on Twitter and on Instagram at DET Sports. And make sure to check out the Sports Commission's terrific website today at DetroitSports.org. And now to our other fine sponsor and fine sponsor of Tiger Talk specifically in the Legacy Football Organization. And by the way, Legacy Football just had a terrific state championship Saturday event at the Legacy Center, the beautiful Legacy Center complex in Brighton, Michigan. And the Legacy Football Organization was founded in 2009. It is led by Justin Sassante, and it is a premier off-season development program in the state of Michigan, in the Midwest, and in the entire U.S. of A. It provides 
provides unique platforms both on and off the football field through community service, social awareness, education, and football. And it consists of a staff that features many former collegiate stars and NFL players, including former three-time All-American linebacker at Michigan State University and Greg Jones, a former guest of Two Bad Hombres as well. And to find out more about Legacy Football and all of the events they are hosting at the Legacy Center Complex in the 2019 calendar year, please contact National Director of Football Ops, Justin Sassante, or go online to Legacy's terrific website at LegacyFootballOrg.com. And it is Dave Stevens of the Disability Channel joining me on Tiger's Talk via Vito's VIP line. Dave, how are you doing? Oh, I'm doing great. Uh, it's tough to be back in the cold weather when just a, a week ago I was out there where you guys are just enjoying the sun. Yeah, you're in the cold now. You're in spring training uh, covering the Tigers and uh, getting to talk to Ron Gardenhire and Miguel Cabrera. And now just to start off, though, Dave, you have a terrific story being born without legs. Please tell me, how tough was it for you, Dave, growing up without legs? Um, I would say it's tough, but I don't know any other way. So I just decided to attack everything like I was normal. So that's why I played baseball in high school and, and got to play minor league baseball and, and do all these things that uh, people with legs don't get to do as far as you know playing college football and all these things. And, uh, you know, I got to come full circle and, and work at ESPN for 20 years, and uh, I, I won seven Emmys with them, and, and now I'm working for the Disability Channel and doing interviews and talking to, you know, Maggie, and so it, uh, it, it's been great. I, I feel blessed. I mean, yeah, it, having no legs is tough, especially in the snow and, and the weather and everything, but uh, I wouldn't trade it just because of the amazing things I've been able to accomplish. Now take us through your journey to get to ESPN. I mean, what a great accomplishment. Like you said, multi-time Emmy Award winning uh, reporter. Great job there. Take us through how you got to ESPN and what are some of the feature stories that you discovered and wrote about? Um, well, you know, I I got to ESPN. I was working uh, local television in Minnesota, which was a, a dream come true in itself because uh, right out of college, after playing college football for three years at Augsburg, and then I tried out for the Dallas Cowboys and then uh, settled down working at a local ABC, ABC affiliate covering the Minnesota Twins in the 87 and 91 uh, World Series, as you know, from 87, uh, beating the Tigers in, in the uh, playoffs. Um, and, and so I got to do that, and I used to interview Puckett and all those guys, Guy Eddie and Herbeck and those guys, and ESPN liked what I did. They said, hey, would you like to come to Connecticut? And I ended up you know, going from being – on camera to being behind the scenes for 20 years and uh, working on so many amazing shows like Sunday NFL Countdown and working with Chris Berman and uh, Tom Jackson and all the baseball guys and Kenny Main is still a good friend of mine, uh, Dan Patrick, you know, you, you really got to see how sports was in its heyday. Uh, so I, I am really blessed that I've really, you know, been able to do all these kind of things and now continue to do so for the Disability Channel um, as far as the things that I get to cover. As a follow-up, when you first hear your name at the Emmy Awards and you hear, okay, you know what, you've done something that has been critically received in a positive light, what's it like when you win an Emmy? It, it really is it's surreal until you've won a few of them. Then it's, then it's just like you just can't imagine how you have so many. Um, and it is, it's funny when your friends grab them and they come over and they, they want to do an acceptance speech because they want to hold them because they're so happy. <laughs> um, you know, for me, that was the ultimate, uh, for my career, the, the, uh, the best moments of my career, because those trophies don't say Dave Stevens, uh, doesn't have legs ESPN. It's just Dave Stevens ESPN based on my ability and not my disability. And that's what I've always really tried to showcase and tell people is that you can do anything in life. I had dreams in high school and you can go on my YouTube channel on Dave Stevens Speaks to see 
me on That's Incredible, an old-time show where I'm on with Tiger Woods, and I said at 14, I, I want to play pro baseball, and I want to work on television and replace Howard Cosell. And here I am at age 53, uh, still living the dream and, and doing these things and sitting down with Miggy and Larry Fitzgerald and, uh, you know, uh, Aaron Rodgers and, and people like that. How was Boomer to work with Chris Berman while you were at ESPN? Because that must have been so darn cool working alongside Chris Berman. It was. Uh, you know, it's sad that this audience nowadays doesn't really get to see what Berman was like in the heyday in the 80s and the 90s and the nicknames and just everybody tuning in because now we can get any type of media at any fingertip to see it, so it's not really that special anymore. But for Boomer, for him to nickname me and I got a nickname of cat because my last name is Stevens. So he called me cat Stevens and it was a cat, a cat, you know, and, and, and it was really cool because most people don't even know who cat Stevens is nowadays. And he's like Joseph years off or some, uh, he, he converted to Islam or whatever. But, uh, you know, I see Chris at the golf tournaments and we still stay in touch and he actually can text. So we text occasionally and uh, now he gets to do some play by play for the Boston Red Sox. So, you know, life is good for boomer and, uh, you know, ESPN, was was an amazing experience for me. So Dave, you've achieved so much in your life. You know, all the high school sports that you played, working at ESPN, playing independent baseball with the St. Paul Saints as well. So all of these different experiences that you have accumulated and garnered throughout your life. And you said at 53 years young, so you've already lived, I mean, a life that a lot of people would like to live one day and despite your disability. So I wanted to ask you now, how have you used your platform, this platform that you've had to really express positivity uh, dealing with your disability and really use that disability as a vehicle for expressing positivity? Now, as a motivational speaker, I get to travel around and give keynotes to, you know, 5,000 people and sometimes as, and as many as 18. Um, and, and I just I stress that it's OK to have dreams. It's OK to have goals as crazy as it may sound. You you have to try and fail if you're going to succeed in this life. And for me, you know, I had a strike out of the gate. Boom. Put it for adoption. Strike two. Born without legs. Strike three. A, a family that adopted me. Very poor. So I grew up in poverty and I had all these things to overcome. And I see people complaining and bitching and moaning and whining and and I'm like, well, what's your excuse? Look what I've done and what I've had to overcome. And, and you guys kind of have it easier than I did. And, and I really want to instill in people that, you know, you got to go out and make the most of life. And it's like I'm still working out with minor league baseball teams. I hung out with Tim Tebow last year in Binghamton for a few days during a, one of my uh, disability dream and do camps that I worked with uh, Dave Clark Foundation and uh, disability dream and do and Doug Cornfield, just a, a great organization putting on uh, baseball camps for disabled kids. But you, you make that impact where kids see you and people see me on a stage and they realize I don't have it as bad. And, and if I – you know, can think of Dave once in a while, then my life might be a little better. Or I might try harder. Or I might think that, you know, hey, I'm pretty blessed. And, and I'm blessed, too. Like I said, I, I'm i not sad I don't have legs. It's a pain in the butt sometimes, especially as I get older. I've had rotator cuff on uh, surgery on the left one, two times on the right. And, you know, I'm probably not supposed to be playing sports at my age, but it got me here. I got to go as long as I can. What word of advice do you have for anybody dealing with a disability today? Well, I think it's both sides. People that have a disability, that most of them just want to be treated normal. They don't want special attention. Uh, obviously, some circumstances, there is a need for help. But I think they want to just be accepted as a human being that can contribute. And on the other hand, I think people have an uncomfortable uncomfortability factor um, that how do I handle someone? How do I deal with this? Is it okay? You know, what do I say? And, and I try to break down barriers for both sides so they can say, hey, look, this guy is just a dude without legs that played sports and did all these things. And he doesn't think he have a disability and doesn't think he's handicapped. And I've never thought of that because that's just a label that people give. You can be white or black, Hispanic, Muslim. That's what you are. But if you have a handicap or a disability, everything is lumped into one big word that covers everything. And we have individuality, and I think people need to see every person for what's good inside rather than what's uh, obvious on the outside. We're speaking to Dave Stevens. You can follow him on Twitter at 44DaveStevens. 
definitely go and check out his website, DaveStevenSpeaks.com, D-A-V-E-S-T-E-V-E-N-S, Speaks.com. That's DaveStevenSpeaks.com for all information regarding Dave Stevens and his great motivational work. Now, you said you had an opportunity to spend time with the Detroit Tigers in Lakeland. What was that experience like, and what did you take away from your time covering the Detroit Tigers? You know, it was a, it's a, I love Gardy's uh, camps. You know, I knew him in Minnesota when he was with the Twins for so long. It was great to see him, uh, catching up with him, but just a, a looseness, but yet uh, they seem like they all like each other and, and everybody was interacting and just loved watching Miggy put on a, a home run display during batting practice and the looseness of everything. And uh, I just think if, if there's some injuries that have healed up and, and Miggy's bat comes back and he's in a lineup every day, uh, you know, there's no reason coming out of the gate, you're zero and zero and you can't have optimism for that club. So, Dave, you said it yourself. You have experience, you know, dating back to Gardenhire's days with the Twins, knowing Ron Gardenhire and the kind of guy and manager that he is. So what kind of impact do you believe he can have on the Tigers moving forward? Well, I know he's a baseball person, a purist, but I know he's also uh, with the times. And so if there are these analytical breakdowns where they say, hey, you can have success with a relief pitcher starting and you can move to a six man rotation and you can do certain things. Uh, you know, he, he loves to make those gut moves, but I also think he gets with the times. And if that's the way the baseball will evolve, you know, God forbid they're going to put four outfielders first position as, as a, you know, to, to get a guy like Bryce Harper out or something. But, you know, I think Gardy knows how to handle the team, a clubhouse, uh, keeping the media uh, away from certain things if certain people struggle, uh, expectations, you know, things like that. And, uh, you know, I, I think I'm excited. You know, I, I'm a, I've always been a Twins guy, but I'm, I have a lot of passion for, for the Tigers and the history of those guys. So they, they've always had a soft spot, and you just want them to get back to where they were a few years ago. I got a question for you in regards to the state of the game. Now, obviously, a lot of people took note of – the way in which free agency went down this year, people are kind of looking at the disparity between the haves and the have-nots. How are you viewing the game of baseball, and do you feel like there's enough competitive balance to keep people interested throughout the 162 games this year in 2019? Oh, it's a great question, and, and, and it was answered by the players when I started doing interviews because for the Disability Channel, we try to stay positive and not try to go to too controversial position just because you can get that at ESPN. Um, but the players seem to want to go to that, and there were many discussions about uh, the free agency situation and the disparity in the, in the contracts, and uh, they were like, well, I don't want to go there. Maybe that's a different interview, and, and Miggy said you know, more to that effect and, and how he got bashed for his contract and Bryce Harper. So um, it, it really is – I don't have those answers, and it really makes you scratch your head that there still are names out there that, that don't have jobs or guys are, are selling for a, a, a lesser – thing and I, I hope we're not going to be coming to some sort of labor show down here in the next couple of years. I want to piggyback off of something you already stated about Bryce Harper and now these teams supposedly might be having four man outfields to defend Bryce Harper when he's up to bat for the Philadelphia Phillies in 2019 which is almost astounding to me as maybe a guy that's not a purist per se I'm only 25 myself but you know I have these uh, memories of baseball being played a different way than it is even now and you think of that and the adjustment that these teams might make to defend Bryce Harper based on analytics and once again it's astounding to me what is your stance on that possibly being implemented by the opposition when defending the likes of Bryce Harper and other superstar sluggers in 2019 and beyond? Well, well for you guys, I, I don't know if you're aware of the Atlantic League allow shifts that they're, they're going to implement rules that Major League Baseball is kind of wanting to let them try because they're independent baseball and they can do whatever they want. So they're shortening the pitch clock. They are going to make bases extended, I think by two inches on each side, they're going to have a rule that uh, you must have two infielders on both sides. So they can't, you can't do any type of extreme shift. Um, they've got all kinds of rules that they're going to just try to see. So, you know, I'm a purist. It's like, you want to go to the game to see a guy hit a ball. And if you're going to take that away, and put 13 players on defense in the NFL, like that's basically what you're doing, you know, in a deep situation uh, for 
uh, any good hitter, you're, you're, you're adding, you know, uh, four or five free safeties. So um, as a baseball purist, yes, you can move them to certain parts, but I, I like that you're a shortstop. You're supposed to be playing shortstop and, and these guys learn to hit and it's tough enough to hit a baseball. It's tougher to then try to refigure and change your hitting stance to uh, adhere to a shift. So nobody's big on the Tigers or the Twins to win the World Series in 2019 because, really, you'd be stupid to do so. Now, with that being said, who is your pick to win the Fall Classic in 2019? It's, a, it's, a, it's going to be a tough one out of the gate. Um, I, 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 I don't see the Red Sox being much different, but uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of excitement in a lot of towns, and uh, it's, it's going to be interesting to see what these – high paid players are going to do. There's a lot of pressure on Bryce Harper now in Philadelphia and they might have the expectations to be the favorite now uh, of him putting them over the top. But, uh, you know, I would love to see a, a Twins run or a Tigers run and just, just be there at least through the all-star break where it's still exciting to go to the games and uh, it means something. I know they're both in rebuilding phases, uh, but uh, you, you just, you you know, that's what spring training is, is great for is like everybody starts out and for at least two weeks, you're in contention. Dave Stevens, thanks for all the time. It's been a pleasure speaking with you and hearing about your story. And best of luck moving forward, too, with your work at the Disability Channel. Appreciate it. Uh, best of luck this year. Thank you. Have a great day. Nice talking to you. We'll talk again soon. And back here on Tiger Stock with Jerko and Company, and our featured guest this week was, once again, Dave Stevens of the Disability Channel, a man that has achieved a lot of success despite his disability and has used his disability as a platform and vehicle for expressing a message of positivity and of encouragement to many people, not even or not only those with disabilities, but also just average Joes that don't have a disability but are down on themselves and feel down and out. Well, he's provided this motivational message throughout the years now as a motivational speaker himself, Doc, of being positive and of being uplifting and of persevering and trucking along through trials and tribulations, as we all have to at one time or another. So a fine speech and story delivered by Dave Stevens that you can find out more about at his personal website, which, Doc, once again, if you can give me that website, DaveStevensSpeaks.com. That is Dave Stevens' a website to check out about all of his work and his work as well for the Disability Channel, which we uh, did mention that he's done work for. And he did cover the Tigers in spring training through the Disability Channel as well. So great stuff from him. Best of luck to him moving forward as well at the Disability Channel. And for you and I now, Doc, to kind of check out the Tigers moving forward, what we want to look out for, I, I think, are the pitchers that we mentioned already rebounding and doing better. Strictly doing better and being more successful arms and maybe bringing a little bit more zip on the radar gun moving forward too throughout spring. If they do that, speaking of Michael Fulmer and Daniel Norris specifically, well, you can start feeling more positive about their outlooks for the 2019 campaign. And then there are some guys, youngsters you want to see keep succeeding, uh, the likes of Daz Cameron, Jamer Candelario. Then you have some bit players, role players like... Ronnie Rodriguez, who has done well so far, has three home runs, I believe, already in spring. Can he keep it up? Because I don't see him keeping it up and lasting on the Tigers' Major League roster throughout the entire 2019 campaign. So he's a guy that's fighting for a roster spot. Can he win that roster spot out of spring? He is fighting for a job. There's not many guys fighting for jobs right now among the Tigers in spring camp. So he is one of those few guys that is. I don't put much stock in his candidacy or hopes for claiming a Major League roster spot because I feel like you've signed some guys, you have some younger guys on the farm, and give them the opportunities ahead of a guy like Ronnie Rodriguez. Rodriguez. Great podcast. You can follow Vito on Twitter at Vito Jerome. Follow the network at Detroit Podcast. If you've enjoyed anything that you've heard today and you want to leave a voicemail, feel free. 248-579-8686. Again, thanks to our great sponsors, the Legacy Football Organization and the Detroit Sports Commission. And we greatly appreciate the conversation that we had with Dave Stevens. Awesome podcast, Vito. I look forward to talking to you in a couple weeks. Adios. 